Since I first started really getting serious with cooking, maybe 10 or 11 years ago, I've been obsessed with making pizza. It was definitely one of the first things I tried to make, and I'm sure there were a lot of pretty bad pizzas, but you know what they say about pizza. All pizza is good pizza, and it's true. Like I've probably made thousands of pizzas over the last 10 years, and I've never really been disappointed, but it's one of those foods, at least for me, that when I make them, I'm never fully satisfied. Like there's always something better I could do, something I can tinker with with the recipe. But I have learned so many skills over the years that I'm gonna teach you in this video to really perfect the dough, to perfect the sauce, and finally the techniques needed to get the pizza that you love, that you would get in a shop, the texture, the crispiness, all of that goodness in your home oven. When it comes to making pizza at home, every element is important, but I do think the dough is the most important. It's like a sandwich. Without good sandwich bread, you're gonna have a really shitty sandwich. It's just the way it goes. So we're really gonna focus our energy on making the perfect pizza dough at home. And most of you will be using something that looks like this right here. This is baker's yeast or active yeast or dry yeast. And what this stuff actually is, is a single isolated strand of yeast, which gives you great control on your fermentation and also gives you a really quick rise, but there are some downsides to that. So most recipes will tell you to just dump in a whole packet, which is great if you want a really quick rise, but since you're speeding up the fermentation, you're gonna be losing a lot of flavor and you really just don't need as much yeast as most recipes say. So instead of adding one tablespoon of yeast or an entire packet of this stuff, I'm just gonna add about one and a half teaspoons so I can extend my fermentation just a a little longer and develop more flavor in my dough. To activate my yeast, I'm gonna add in some warm water and I'm also gonna add in a little bit of honey. You can use sugar or you can skip this step, but I like adding a little bit of extra sweetness to my dough and yeast feeds off sugar. So this is always gonna help with the activation of the yeast. All right, this has been activating for about 15 minutes and you can see we've got some nice bubbles. It smells yeasty and you wanna make sure your yeast is activated. You don't wanna go further if there's there's no sign of activation or your bread won't rise because sometimes these packets they'll die out over time. Another thing I see a lot with pizza recipes out there are hydration levels that are super low, giving you a denser dough. And we want some of that fluffiness in our crust, which means we don't wanna to add too much flour. So what I'm gonna do is use both some Italian style double zero flour and also some all purpose flour. You can use 100% all purpose flour, no problem. Sometimes I'll use whole wheat. It's really up to you and what you have in your pantry. But I'm just gonna start off with two cups cups of each and we'll see how the dough goes because all flour is not created equal and it's going to absorb the water at different levels. So we wanna start with less flour and have the ability to add more rather than the opposite. It's much harder to add water once you've added your flour into your dough. We've got our flour added. I'm just gonna add about two teaspoons of salt. And then this isn't necessary, but I like adding some olive oil to really get a nice smooth and flavorful dough. That's about two tablespoons of olive oil right there. All right, so you can tell we're way too thin on that. So I'm gonna need at least another cup of flour and we'll mix that up and see where we're at. So this dough is a, probably a little more wet than you might be used to, but don't be scared of the stickiness at this point. As it rests, it will get more smooth. And also when we knead it, we're gonna be adding more flour. So that's gonna remove some of the stickiness and also lower the hydration. So I'm just gonna let this sit for about 15 minutes to rest, and then we'll start the kneading process. So I've been kneading this dough for about four or five minutes and tip number three is just giving your dough some space. When you're rolling out gluten and working gluten, it will tighten up. And if you give it some time to rest, your dough is gonna completely transform. So if it ever feels like it's too sticky or it's really tensing up on you, just give it like five, 10 minutes to rest and then come back at it and start kneading it again. All right, so check this out. 
starting to get very smooth. So before you start going and adding a ton of flour because you're nervous that it's sticking, just let it rest. Look how much better that already looks. So I'm just gonna give it a few more minutes of kneading and this thing will be ready to proof. looking very nice and smooth and supple. So we're ready to proof. I'm just gonna throw that right into here. Now this is the first proofing and fermentation right here. We're gonna let this double in size. It should take around one to three hours, depending on how much yeast you put in and your environment. But this gives us a great time to work on some sauce. I wanna take a quick break from pizza to tell you about today's video sponsor, Bright Cellars, which is very relevant for tonight's meal because I love wine when it comes to Italian food and especially for pizza night. But when I go into a wine shop, I have no idea what I'm doing. Wine is something that I like, but I just don't know that much about, which is why Bright Cellars is great. They're curating wine from all around the world to fit your palate and also pair well with what you're serving up. All you have to do is take a quick seven question quiz and once they have your flavor preferences, Bright Cellars goes to work curating the perfect wine that they send right to your doorstep, which is fantastic for a time like this because I'm certainly not going to the market right now. So because I did that online quiz, I got a nice variety here. I've got some red, I've got some whites, but of course you can get anything you want. And then there's another row. Wow, quarantine just got a little better. If you don't like a bottle that you got in your order, Bright Cellars will actually replace that bottle in your next order, which is great. But I'm excited to try these. I think my favorite part about Bright Cellars are definitely these education cards. And I'm a food nerd, so I like learning about my drinks, understanding where it comes from, the flavor notes, and of course the pairings. Wandering Giants is the one for this pizza party because check this out. Pairings, bold smoked cheeses, sausage and mushroom stromboli, and swanky dinner parties. Now just having that little pairing section is fantastic. That's so much more information and knowledge than I would ever have with wine pairing. So if you're interested in getting wine delivered to you for your own dinner parties, Bright Cellars is giving you 50% off your first six bottle box. So make sure you check the link in the description and take your quiz to get started today. So I'm not gonna sit here and tell you I have the perfect pizza sauce recipe because there are so many different ways to make pizza sauce. Every pizzeria has their own twists and their own version and different styles of pizzas traditionally have different styles of pizza sauces. But one thing I don't want you doing is buying a pre-made pizza sauce because I feel like it's just not worth it and normally they aren't that great. And it's really easy to take a can of tomatoes and to enhance it into a delicious pizza sauce. So that's what we're gonna do right now. The first thing I'm gonna do is slice up a few cloves of garlic. It's totally up to you how much garlic you wanna use. And then I'm gonna get a pan on medium heat and add in some olive oil and just start frying up that garlic on a very low heat, making sure to not burn your garlic. Now this is optional, but I like a little spice in my tomato sauce. So I'm gonna take some chili flakes. You can use fresh chilies as well. And I'm gonna sprinkle those into the oil. So what I'm doing here is I'm on a very low heat, a two right now, making sure that the garlic doesn't burn. And I'm just slowly infusing the garlic and the chili into the oil. So basically just making a flavored oil. I've got my tomatoes here. These are crushed tomatoes, you know, and you can have any type of tomatoes, but the key right here, we've got vine ripened crushed tomatoes. That's the only ingredient on the ingredient list. You don't want a ton of other stuff. You don't want tomato puree, you don't want basil. It's just pure tomatoes going in. And then all of this tomato in there, fill that about three quarters of the way, dump it back in. And now that what that does is it gives us extra liquid so we can reduce this and let that oil infuse and really build flavor over time. So I'll just keep that on a low heat and simmer that away for the next hour, maybe two hours until I've got a tasty tomato sauce. All right, I've been cooking this down for about an hour and a half on a nice low heat. It's looking good. I'm just getting it to the thickness and consistency that I want. And then of course, just make sure it is seasoned properly. 
So let that cool and we'll make some pizzas tomorrow. Here you go. It's been proofing for about two hours. Remember, if you use less yeast, it's going to take longer than the traditional recipes. So we're going to shape these into some nice uh, pizza doughs. And my next tip is to always pre-shape your pizza dough. When you go to a pizza shop, you always see them pulling out these perfectly shaped doughs from the containers, and then they can just effortlessly shape the pizzas. If we just started to roll out this shape, it would be very difficult to roll out into that perfect circle. So we're just gonna take our dough, sort of fold it on to itself like that, kind of roll it up into a roll like that, and then just start tucking it and pulling it and getting some tension. And every time you pull, you're using a little bit of that stickiness of the dough on your surface to create tension. And you'll see as we keep pulling and let it stick to the surface, we've got these beautiful circular dough balls. And that's all right if you get these bubbles like that, that's actually kind of nice. Good sign of fermentation right there. It's happening. Just gonna take a little bit of semolina. You can use flour to non-stick your surface. We'll add these babies. Spread them out because they will rise. And then I'm just gonna hit them with a tiny bit of olive oil on each. And this is gonna keep the surfaces from drying out. Keep them nice and moist, which is very important. We have our beautiful pizza doughs right here. And I told you about lowering the yeast levels for a longer fermentation, but another way to develop a lot more flavor in your dough is to slow down the fermentation by throwing these in the fridge overnight. So most pizza shops do take advantage of this. Sometimes they'll let these dough balls proof in the fridge for two, three days. We're just gonna let them proof for 24 hours. And of course, if you wanna make pizza the same day, just let these sit out at room temperature until they gain a little size. But we're taking the long road on this dough for the ultimate results. So I'll just put some plastic wrap on this and we will throw it in the fridge for at least 24 hours. One of the best parts about making pizza at home is it gives you a chance to customize your own pizza and also use up what you have in the refrigerator, which is a big bonus. But I do ask that you give your toppings a little love. There's nothing worse than going to a pizza shop and you can see that they just threw on like some raw mushrooms. There's no way a mushroom is gonna taste delicious if you just throw it in an oven for five minutes. It's just not gonna be good. So what I had in the fridge were some mushrooms and some spinach. And to cook the mushrooms, I just took out a pan, added a little butter through my sliced mushrooms a little bit of salt and just cook those down until the water released and then once the water releases and evaporates then you're starting to fry those up in oil and I just cooked them until they had some nice color and then I removed those and for the spinach I used the same technique as we used for the tomato sauce which was adding a little bit of oil throwing in some garlic frying up that garlic in the oil and just wilting that down until that garlic oil really infuses in the spinach and sometimes I'll just blanch ingredients like if I have some broccoli rub I'll blanch that and throw it on raw but it is nice to just enhance your ingredients a little bit before they go onto the pizza Tip number eight is understanding your oven because all ovens are not created equal. So if a recipe tells you to do one thing, well, they might be using a completely different oven. So if I take a look inside my oven, this is an electric oven and I can already see there's a heating element right here. So I wanna take advantage of that because that's where I'm gonna get a ton of heat output. But sometimes ovens will only have an electric coil down here or some type of gas coming from the bottom. So wherever the oven is hottest, that's where you want to put your pizza because you're gonna get the crispiest crust coming directly from your heat source. And tip number nine is cranking your oven to the highest temperature that it goes because the longer your pizza is in the oven, the more moisture will be pulled out of the crust. So it starts to dry out, which is why a lot of pizzas at home taste dry and not super moist like you get at a pizza shop. Now, of course our oven isn't gonna get up to a thousand degrees, like a wood fire oven. So we're not gonna be able to cook our pizza in three minutes 
but you do want to crank your oven up to the highest temperature that it goes. For some reason, people seem to be scared to crank their oven to the highest temperature and they're just set on putting it at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. But your oven can get pretty high, usually around 500 degrees, and you just want to go to the highest temperature possible. This thing goes to about 550 degrees and I'm going to set it on convection because that's going to give me a little extra heat as well. All right, now that our oven's preheating, there's something very important I gotta get. This right here is a pizza steel that I have, but you might have a ceramic pizza stone. The key is getting something that can absorb all of this heat, and that's what a classic brick oven does. The bricks in the oven work as a thermal mass absorber, and they take in all of that heat from the fire, and then when you put the pizza on the bricks, it transfers all of that heat into the pizza, giving it a nice spring, a nice crust, and it cooks it extremely fast. So anything really heavy, that's gonna absorb a lot of heat. You wanna use that. You can pull this off with a cast iron pan as well, or ceramic, or in this case, I have this pizza steel, and I wanna let this preheat for at least 45 minutes to an hour. It needs a lot of time to absorb all of that heat. Been just about 24 hours, and check out, check out these babies. Oh boy, those are beautiful. You can see they've proofed a nice bit. They're now touching and they weren't, of course, before. They're still nice and moist, but I did want to take these out while the oven is preheating just to give them at least an hour, hour and a half to get back to room temperature. So we have our beautiful pizza doughs right here. And tip number 10 is making sure that you roll your pizza dough out in something because you don't want to go this far and put all this effort in the dough and just have the dough stick to the table. So your three main options are more flour, which is totally fine. You can roll it out in oil, which I do all the time if you want a nice crispy crust and you want to avoid more mess. Oil's actually pretty nice and clean if you just have a countertop like this. But I'm gonna use some semolina flour today. I like rolling it out because it gets pushed into the crust and you get a really nice toasted semolina flavor when you go to cook your pizzas. So let's roll out some pizza. All right, so I'll just sprinkle on that semolina. Wow. Super fluffy. Tip number 11 is making sure you keep the integrity of your crust when you go to roll out your dough. Because we developed all of this air, as you can see that air bubble, in our dough. And if you want a nice fluffy dough, we're not just gonna take a rolling pin and roll out our dough because we'll deflate all of those beautiful air pockets that we created. So I'm just going around the dough like this creating that crust, creating that edge, that barrier right there to hold in all your ingredients, and then making sure to not push into the crust like this. Once you've created the crust, we're gonna work the dough from the inside. So you start by just patting it out like this, getting the crust, getting your circular shape, and then we can start just letting gravity take over. It's as simple as that. You see, I'm going around the edges, right under that crust. You can see where my fingers are. Oh, you can see I have a few holes. It's totally fine. I wasn't really paying attention, but there you go. We're already at the size. That might even be a little thin, but hey, it's my first pizza, so it's not a problem. I'm gonna take my pizza peel, sprinkle on some more of that semolina so it slips right off, and then we'll just boom right on there. So tip number 12 is to keep it simple. So you really can taste the essence of the dough and the sauce, and the toppings are just a little extra boost. So I'm gonna start off with just some tomato sauce, not so much that it gets soupy. You want just a nice coating for flavor. Then I'm gonna hit it with just a little bit of that spinach and mushrooms. Of course it needs cheese. I'm gonna be using fresh mozzarella and I'm just going to spot that throughout the pizza nice and evenly. And then a few basil leaves for a little extra flavor. That looks absolutely fantastic. Still feels like it will slide right off. We are preheated right now and tip number 13 is taking advantage of the broiler. That pizza steel's been in there. It's been absorbing all of that heat and it's good to go. It's gonna give you a nice crispy crust when you throw the pizza on it, but we need a nice crispy crust and we also wanna be cooking from the top to char the top of your pizza like it's coming out of a pizza oven. So what I'm gonna do is right when the pizza hits that steel, I'm gonna change the oven from convection heat 
to broil on high. And then we're gonna get that char from the top, but still get that crispy crust from the heat already in the steel. And I'll give credit to Kenji Lopez on that one. I'm pretty sure he created this technique, but I haven't tried in a while. So we'll see what happens. But luckily I have three other attempts at it to get it perfect. All right, let's see if I can do this one-handed. Baby, slide off. Already here cooking away. Oven closed, broil, oven changed. So we'll see what happens. I might need to change it to a low broil. All right, I think good things are happening in here. Let's give it a, a peek. Oh boy, that is, that is done. Come on. So we got some great leopard spotting and a lot of that has to do with the longer fermentation times. You get those fermentation bubbles and they burn up in the oven. Under crust, crispy, looking good. And then that char on the ingredients. I am very, very happy with this right here. Tip number 14 is adding some next level flavor right here. So what I did last night was chopped up a bunch of garlic, added that to a jar with some chili flakes and some oregano, and then topped that off with some oil. I only had grapeseed oil, but I would definitely recommend olive oil. And you can put whatever you want in this, but this is a flavor bomb right here, and I'm just gonna sprinkle some on my pizza. Of course, this is gonna be much better the longer that it sits, but just a little chili, garlic, oregano oil to cap it off. And then I would definitely suggest just a sprinkle of salt to make sure all of those flavors come alive. This, this thing came out great. So let's give this a try. Crust is amazing. Beautiful, fluffy crust. Crispy bottom, I think we could get a little more char on the bottom. Mmm, mmm. It's fantastic, but my head goes right away to the improvements and it needs a crispier under crust. Maybe if I just keep preheating that in there for a little longer, it will give me a crispier crust or I can start the broiler a little later. Damn, fluffy love. So this was incredible, but tip number 15 is just accepting the learning curve. Of course, right when I taste it, I'm just thinking about how I can improve. And I've been making pizza for 10 years and I'm still trying to get better. So just keep that in mind. Pizza is all about the quest. It's all about trying to get that perfect pie at home. And that's what makes it so fun. And you can serve it to your friends, see what they think, get the feedback and then improve. Round two, let's see where we're at. Oh, that one got extra charred. Wow. This one, the crust feels a little better. What I did was I let it sit in the oven for a minute before I set the broiler and I can tell it's got a crispier crust. Yeah, listen to that. Still not charred like I want it, but definitely crispier. You can see it holds up. This one is a lot better with that crispy under crust. Little tinkers for perfection. So I'm really happy with that minor adjustment. So I actually just posted that last pizza on my Instagram, Life by Mike G. I thought it looked beautiful. I prefer the char. When a pizza comes out at a restaurant and it's got a nice char, that's when I know they're doing something right. But I would say overwhelmingly, maybe 70% of you thought it was too burnt, which I understand by the picture. And of course, if you don't like it burnt, just keep it in the oven for another two minutes without the broil, then change it to broil for the last minute or so. But hopefully this video helps you on your quest for perfect homemade pizza at home. And make sure you click the link below to check out Bright Sellers, which made a perfect pairing for our pizza party last night and much more homemade goodness coming to you very soon. I've been very inspired in the kitchen with all of this time at home. I've been cooking up so much stuff and I've got a lot of great ideas to keep you inspired at home over the next few months. So I'll see you soon.